Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the brutal murder of Joyce Goodener. A murder which remained unsolved for almost 14 years before a deathbed confession finally resolved the case. Joyce Dean Goodener was born on the 2nd of July 1960 in Tennessee. Details about her early life have been scarce, but it is believed that she had three daughters, born in 1976, 1980 and 1982. It is safe to assume that her life was particularly difficult, as in 1995, her address was listed as a family life centre in Tennessee, an organisation which provides women and children with emergency shelter, food and clothing. On Wednesday 5th of July 1995, the emergency services attended a fire at an empty house. This was just off of the Ashland City Highway in Nashville. The abandoned building was previously owned by a church but was now so overgrown that it was more or less obscured from view by trees and bushes. The emergency services arrived just before midday and inside of the burning building they found the body of a woman who had been rolled up in a rug, doused with accelerant and set alight. A post-mortem revealed the body to be that of Joyce. It was just three days after her 35th birthday. The post-mortem also determined that Joyce had been stabbed in the neck and beaten with a concrete block. She was already dead before she was set on fire. As the murder investigation began, a truck driver came forward to say that he had seen two men fleeing the abandoned house at around 11.30am that morning. The truck driver provided a detailed description of the two men, stating that they had sped away from the scene in a dark green or blue longbed Toyota truck. In addition, the police were contacted by a witness who stated that she had driven by the house at around 10.30 a.m. on the morning of the 5th of July and had noticed a dirty black Chevrolet Camaro in the driveway. This witness had also noticed the silhouette of someone inside of the house who she believed to be a man. When she drove past again about 30 minutes later, the Chevrolet Camaro had gone. As the investigation progressed, the police were able to track down the two men who had been seen running away from the crime scene. James Roy Smithers and his 16-year-old stepson had seen the smoke coming from the house and had stopped to see if they could be of any help. Through the smoke, they could see Joyce's body wrapped in the rug and raced away in order to call 911. Their story checked out, it was found that they had alerted the emergency services at 11.33am and they were subsequently ruled out of the investigation. Joyce's boyfriend, Luther Wynne, was interviewed and he stated that he had last seen Joyce early in the morning on the 5th of July, which was just before he went to work. It was then confirmed that Luther had been at work at the time of the murder so he was not considered to be a suspect. Luther did, however, provide the police with an additional lead. The lead was that Joyce may have been with a man by the name of James Washington on the day of her death. On 10th of July 1995, five days after the murder, James Washington was interviewed by the police. He stated that he had left for work at around 6am that morning but when he arrived, he decided that he would not work that day because it was raining heavily. Instead, he visited a friend by the name of Lucy, and the pair smoked crack cocaine together for around half an hour. Following this, he went to visit another friend, but on the way there, he ran out of petrol. After finding a petrol can and buying around $2 worth of fuel, he drove to the house of a man by the name of Henry. As he arrived at Henry's house, Joyce was just leaving and James agreed to give her some of his crack cocaine in return for sexual favours. 
The pair had sex in an alleyway off of 10th Avenue before James drove Joyce back to Henry's house. Joyce asked James to wait for her, saying that she would be back out in about 30 minutes. After waiting for around 45 minutes, James left and returned home. Also on the 10th of July, the police spoke to James's girlfriend, Rosalind Butler. The couple had been living together for around two and a half years. Rosalind confirmed that James had left for work early on Wednesday the 5th of July. However, beyond that she was unaware of his whereabouts on that day. She advised that three days later on the 8th of July, she had asked James to move out of their home as she was concerned about his extensive drug use. With this request to move out, James returned to live with his mother. Rosalind also confirmed that James drove a black and grey Chevrolet Camaro, which matched the one that had been spotted at the crime scene on the day of the murder. A $1,000 reward was offered for information that would lead to the case being solved. With no additional leads, the case soon went cold. It would take another 14 years for further progress to be made. In March 2009, James was incarcerated at the Turney Centre in Tennessee. Three years earlier, he had been found guilty of attempted second-degree murder and received a 15-year prison sentence. On the 3rd of March 2009, 50-year-old James suffered a heart attack and several seizures. He was rushed to the prison infirmary and from there was transported to Nashville General Hospital. As James was on his deathbed, he motioned to the guard, Officer James Tomlinson, that he needed to talk to him. The prisoner said, I've got something to tell you. I've got something I need to get off my conscience. I have killed somebody. Officer Tomlinson went to get his superior officer and when the two men returned, James repeated that he had killed someone. He told them that, I want to confess about killing a girl and stated that the girl's name was Joyce Good Something and that the murder had taken place near Ashland City. The officers did not know what medication James had been given that day, but noted that he seemed very calm and wanted to clear his conscience before dying. However, the unexpected then happened. James's health began to drastically improve and, as he recuperated, he attempted to recant his confession, but without success. Shortly after, the case went to trial and 14 years after Joyce's murder, James was convicted of first degree murder. He was sentenced to 51 years to life in prison. James attempted to appeal his conviction on the basis that he was having hallucinations due to his medication at the time of the confession and also that the incriminating statement was not knowingly and voluntarily given due to it being made without the benefit of a Miranda warning. It was counter-argued that his medication did nothing more than calm him and reduce his blood pressure. And it was also stated that he did not need to be read his Miranda rights as his statement was not made as the result of a custodial interrogation. The appeal court sustained his conviction and he remains in prison at Whiteville Correctional Facility to this day. Had he not confessed, he would almost certainly have been released from his original sentence by now. I'm sorry to say that there wasn't a picture of Joyce that I could use for this case. As always, my heart goes out to the victims and their families. Please leave any comments down below. As usual, I will be interested in reading your comments. I keep getting asked how do you share videos, so here is a very quick guide for those that don't know how to. If you're using a computer or a laptop, then you click on the share arrow. Then if you have a community tab, you can share it. Or simply select one of the apps or click on the copy button and then you can paste it.
If you have a mobile, then you can click on the share button. And can click on the apps or copy the link to share. I hope that helps the people that didn't know. Thanks for listening to the Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. What would you confess to if you were in this situation? Goodbye.